the United States, we consume 3.9 trillion kilowatt hours of electricity each year. To put that into perspective, if you compare 1950 to now, the US population grew by 2.2 times, yet our electricity consumption grew by 13 times. In fact, the US consumes the most electricity in the world after China. Of course, the US is trying to be more green and move away from fossil fuels. Some place their bet on wind energy, some on solar, and others on nuclear. But today, I'm busting some myths. We'll see why wind energy isn't as effective as you might think, and how installing solar panels in the Sahara Desert will lead to a global catastrophe, and why Elon Musk thinks nuclear power is the best energy source. We'll also see why Toyota CEO Akio Toyota believes Japan will run out of electricity if everyone were to drive EVs. Here in the U.S., some 61% of the nation's electricity gets generated by fossil fuels. I'm talking mostly natural gas and coal. We also get 19% of our electricity from nuclear energy and another 20% from renewable sources. But let's look at tech giants in the U.S. and how they're using renewable energy. Take, for example, Apple. Its main headquarters, which is called Apple Park, houses some 12,000 employees. The main building is what's called the Ring, although many also call it the Apple Spaceship. It's 2.8 million square feet of office space. That's nearly 43 football fields. Or if you're not into football, imagine 28 Walmart stores. The roof is almost completely covered by solar panels. The 10,000 car parking structure also covered by solar panels. According to Apple, 100% of its data centers and 96% of its other facilities run on renewable energy. The campus generates 17 megawatts of solar power on its rooftops and it powers 75% of the buildings during the daytime. That amount is equivalent to powering 2,400 average U.S. homes. By comparison, Google's headquarters, which is called Googleplex, produces just 1.6 megawatts. Or check out Tesla's Nevada Gigafactory. Actually, Tesla's Nevada Gigafactory is jointly operated by Panasonic to produce battery cells for the Tesla EV battery packs, drivetrains, and stationary energy storage products. Back in 2017, Tesla announced its plans for a massive 70 megawatt rooftop array at the Gigafactory, which would make it the largest in the world and actually blow Apple's roof out of the water. But the thing is, Tesla started construction on the solar array back in 2018, and it continues to expand solar and installations. At present, the solar panels have a capacity of 8 megawatts, which is half of Apple's capacity for now. Did you know that the 10 largest solar plants in the world are all located in deserts or dry regions? Some researchers think it could be possible to turn the world's largest desert, the Sahara, into a giant solar farm. According to German physicist Gerhard Kunis, in just six hours, deserts around the world would receive 173,000 terawatts of solar energy via solar panels. That's more solar energy than humans consume in a year. So, in reality, we'd be able to harvest a lot more energy than we ever could possibly need. In 2009, the Desert Tech Foundation launched an initiative to power Europe with solar energy generated in the deserts. But quickly after it was established, the initiative began to fail because of problems related to its feasibility, transportation, and cost. At first glance, putting solar panels in the Sahara might seem like a fantastic idea. But here's the thing you have to remember. The black surfaces of solar panels absorb most of the sunlight that reaches them. But only 15% of all that incoming energy gets converted to electricity. The rest goes back to the environment as heat. Now picture the Sahara covered in solar panels. Sure, it produced a lot of electricity. But remember, 85% of all that sunlight would go back into the desert as pure heat. But it wouldn't just affect the Sahara Desert. Actually, all that remitted heat would go back into the atmosphere and affect the globe. In a 2018 study, researchers used the climate model to simulate the effects of lower albedo on the land surface of deserts due to hypothetical solar farms. Albedo is basically the measure of how well surfaces reflect sunlight. In the climate model, researchers found that once the size of the solar farm reaches 20% of the total area of the Sahara, it triggers a feedback loop. All the emitted heat ends up creating a major temperature difference between the land and the surrounding oceans, and that lowers air pressure. And once that happens, moist air rises and condenses into raindrops, which creates more more monsoons. Now plants love water so they would thrive. The more plants in the environment, the more water gets absorbed, which creates a more humid environment. Pretty much it would turn the Sahara into a green oasis. All that sounds great, except for one thing. According to one model, covering 20% of the Sahara with solar farms would impact local and global temperatures. But as this warming spreads across the globe, polar regions would warm more than the tropics. We're talking about lots of melted ice. And melted sea ice exposes dark water that absorbs a lot of solar energy. Precipitation patterns around the world would change. The Amazon region would experience drought since less moisture would be arriving from the ocean. And on top of all that, tropical cyclones would more frequently hit the coast of North America and East Asia. So you see, altering the environment and ecosystem 
ecosystem has global impact in huge proportions. But let's imagine that somehow we can address all the potentially catastrophic effects caused by the Sahara solar farm. We'd still be left with the question of how to store and transport all this energy. We'd need massive batteries to store all the terawatts of generated electricity. Each panel would need an individual battery or an uninterrupted power supply that would last throughout the day. And that is not cheap. Also, imagine the logistics nightmare and infrastructure needed to supply the whole world with energy generated from a solar plant in the middle of a desert. This is a whole nother story of its own. Right now as it is, Africa is running behind on its development of reliable electrical grids. Plus, long distance transportation of energy through power lines is complex and expensive. And that's why we're likely not going to see the Sahara covered in solar panels. But now let's talk about wind energy. Actually, it's one of the fastest growing sources of renewable energy. Now, obviously, it's clean and doesn't emit greenhouse gases. Wind turbines are placed far apart, which means the space between each turbine can be used for things like farming. You don't need to pay for the fuel to power the turbine since wind is free. Studies have found that wind energy costs is around 0.029 per kilowatt hour, whereas coal costs about 0.036 per kilowatt hour. Between 2010 and 2018, the amount of installed wind capacity in the U.S more than doubled to produce enough wind to power over 30 million homes. In 2020, around 120,000 Americans had wind power related jobs. Believe it or not, being a wind turbine technician is actually the second fastest growing job here in the United States. By 2050, it's predicted there will be over 600,000 wind powered related jobs. Government organizations will also pay you if you allow them to install wind turbines on your land. In some cases, you can even get paid by the electric company. When you look at all the pros, wind energy seems like a perfect energy source. But to make a fair assessment, we also have to look at the cons. First of all, wind is unpredictable. Wind energy can only be produced when there's blowing wind. And that doesn't just happen consistently every day. Also, a severe storm or high winds can potentially harm a wind turbine, especially if it gets struck by lightning. If a wind turbine falls off during a storm, it could injure or even kill people nearby. Wind turbines can also kill wildlife. Any bat bird or flying animal that gets into a rotating wind turbines is not likely to survive. Some studies estimated that anywhere between 140,000 to 500,000 birds die every year because of wind turbines. Also, wind turbines are not silent. While they don't make as much noise as a construction site, they do emit a mechanical hum and a whooshing sound. On the bright side, newer wind turbines are much quieter than the older ones. While the wind that fuels them is free, wind turbines are not. Actually, wind turbines are pretty expensive to buy up front. Lastly, for some people, wind turbines are also a major eyesore in an otherwise picturesque landscape. If you were to ask Elon Musk what he thinks the best energy source for the future is, he wouldn't say solar or wind energy. Believe it or not, he'd tell you it's nuclear power. He's even referred to himself as pro-nuclear, according to Elon Musk. If there's not like massive natural disaster risk, then there's really no danger with the nuclear power plants. In Elon Musk's opinion, nuclear power plants are safe, and he believes it's possible to make extremely safe nuclear fission. A nuclear fission reaction is what happens in conventional nuclear reactors, where a neutron hits a larger atom and splits into two smaller atoms, which results in a release of energy. Contrast that with nuclear fusion, where smaller atoms slam together and join a heavier atom and release energy. Basically the opposite of nuclear fission. Our sun generates energy through fusion, for example. Musk has described our sun as a big fusion reactor in the sky that comes up daily. Now, most people believe that fusion is a safer way to generate nuclear energy. That's because fission creates dangerous, long-lasting radioactive waste. But according to Elon Musk, nuclear fission is not only safe, it's the best way to go. All that said, Musk also believes in a long-term. Solar batteries will be the main long-term uh, way that civilization is powered. But between now and then, we, we need uh, to maintain nuclear. But here's the thing, nuclear power is far from perfect. Just look at what happened in Japan back in 2011. On March 11, 2011, Japan was hit with a 9.0 magnitude earthquake. The earthquake caused a tsunami that flooded 216 square miles. It damaged or destroyed over 1 million buildings and killed some 19,500 people. At the time of the earthquake, 11 reactors at four nuclear plants were operating in the region. As soon as the earthquake hit, all the reactors shut down immediately. And that was that. Except it wasn't, because then the tsunami hit. At 3.42 p.m., the first tsunami hit the reactors. Eight minutes later, the second tsunami wave hit. These two waves submerged and damaged the seawater pumps from the main condenser circuits and the auxiliary cooling circuits. They also drowned the diesel generators that flooded the electrical switchgear and batteries. Not only did this cause a station blackout, but it disabled the power 
supplying cooling at three of the Fukushima Daiichi reactors. And that caused a nuclear catastrophe. All three cores melted. On the international nuclear and radiological event scale, the nuclear accident was rated at level 7 because of the high radioactive releases. While the level 7 nuclear accident didn't cause any direct deaths, it was serious enough for over 100,000 people to be evacuated from their homes as a preventative measure. Even down to today, it's still unclear the exact amount of radioactive materials that were released into the air. The problem was that 23 out of the 24 radiation monitoring stations on the plant site were disabled by the tsunami, so tracking the exact radioactive waste was near impossible to do. But in any case, it was enough for a nuclear emergency to be declared. The Fukushima prefecture issued an evacuation order for people within 1.2 miles of the plant. Later, the prime minister extended the evacuation order to 1.9 miles, then 6.2 miles, and then 12.4 miles. Now, for most of us, a 9.0 earthquake followed by a major tsunami isn't a likely disaster for where we live. But that doesn't mean that nuclear power plants don't have the potential to cause major damage. For example, think of what happens during war. Of course, we can't talk about electricity without mentioning electric vehicles. With the combustion engine ban approaching faster than ever, more companies are focusing on optimizing electrical sources to power their next generation EVs. But when it comes to Akio Toyota, the CEO of Toyota, he has some concerns. Back in 2020, Akio Toyota claimed that if everyone were to drive EVs, Japan would run out of electricity in the summer. In fact, he says that if Japan were to push forward and ban combustion engine cars, the current business model of the car industry would collapse. And since Japan gets most of its electricity, for burning coal and natural gas, if the country has to build more EVs, then carbon emission would actually get worse. But now you tell me, did this video change your view about the best form of energy to power the future? Please share by commenting below. If you like this video, please like, share, and subscribe. Thanks for your support.